Hi everyone, welcome to this live stream on how to connect with customers and manage your business remotely, hosted by Grow With Google. Grow With Google helps people grow their skills, careers, and businesses by offering free digital skills trainings and tools. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Basim, one of the instructors here at Grow With Google, and I'm so excited to have you here with us today. So today we are going to share some tools and tips to help you better connect with your current and potential customers, as well as discuss some ways to better manage your business in a remote environment. I'll also be answering some of your questions live at the end of today's workshop. If you have any questions you would like me to answer, be sure to use the Q&A section below the video player by clicking the blue button that says, ask a question. We'll choose a top voted question, so make sure to upvote your favorites. Uh, so if you don't get to answer all of your posted questions, our team will reply directly in the Q&A section shortly after the virtual event concludes. Uh, we also encourage you to use the chat feature for any comments you may have uh, and to also engage with other attendees who are watching the workshop. Uh, this chat will be available to those who opt in and can be found directly to the right of the video player on your screen. Uh, if you would like to access the additional resources for this class, check the resources section below the video player on the right-hand side. Uh, this also includes a copy of today's presentation. You will also be able to access a replay of this virtual event in the future by clicking on demand on the Growth Google on your homepage. And also don't forget to post and share on social using hashtag GrowWithGoogle. Finally, you also have the option to turn on YouTube's closed captioning to follow along. To do so, click the closed captioning button directly on the video player on your screen. All right, let's get started. Okay, so in this presentation, we're going to discuss ways you can engage with customers online and use Google tools to stay productive no matter where you are. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about how to connect with customers via a Google business profile. Uh, then we'll show you how to connect and communicate remotely with your customers, your colleagues and employees with Google Calendar and Google Meet. Third, we'll show you how to access files from anywhere using Google productivity tools. Uh, and then we will end with some suggestions for your next steps and additional resources. So this, this workshop will focus on what Google calls the consumer version of the tools. Uh, they can be accessed from what you probably call your regular or your personal Gmail account. Um, and they're available at no cost. Uh, there's also a business version of these tools called Google Workspace. Uh, there are a few features mentioned today that are available only in Google Workspace. I will point them out when we actually get there. All right, so let's start by talking about a Google business profile. Now, businesses with brick and mortar locations open to customers and local businesses with service areas can create uh, business profiles at no cost. If you have a business profile, uh, it's important to keep it current uh, and provide accurate information uh, for your customers. If you have not yet created or claimed a business profile, you can get started by visiting google.com slash business. Uh, you will follow a set of prompts asking for basic information. Uh, then you will verify your ownership of your business. Uh, that's usually handled by Google mailing a postcard to your business address. Once you receive that card and enter in the verification code, your business can go live on Google. So a business profile is a one-stop shop for managing your business information as it appears across Google Search and Google Maps. Uh, business profiles work on all devices, including desktop computers, laptops, tablets, and mobile devices. Uh, so potential customers can find you no matter where they find you online. Uh, they all show a variety of details that can help searches find information about your business. Like most Google tools, you need to be signed into a Google account to create or manage a business profile. Uh, if you don't have a Google account, you can set one up for free uh, and you can choose to set up a new Gmail address or you can use another email address you already have and then like register it as a Google account by visiting accounts.google.com slash sign up. Uh, if your business or employer uses Google Workspace, you may actually already have an email address that doesn't look like a Gmail address, but is still a Google account. If you aren't sure if your email is powered by Google Workspace, check with your team at work. So once you've created a, and verified your business profile, you can edit the information Google displays and keep your business details up to date. 
Uh, there are also many built-in features that allow you to share updates and engage with customers. Uh, you can edit your business description to share important information. You can manage your hours of operation, including things like holiday hours and more hours for specific services, like for an example would be additional hours for curbside pickup. Uh, you can publish posts to share updates and read and respond publicly to those customer reviews. And we'll share some tips uh, to help you with those customer review responses. Uh, and you can also turn on messages, which is labeled chat in the business profile. Uh, if you turn on this optional feature, it allows customers to send messages to your business directly from your business profile on mobile devices. Once you've created and verified your business profile, you can add, edit, and remove information directly on the Google search results page. Keep in mind, only authorized people can edit your business information. And so the editors must be signed into a Google account that manages the business profile. So in other words, other people can't change your business information without having access to your account. Uh, so you would start by doing a Google search for your business name. Uh, you should see your business appear uh, with buttons that allow you to edit different types of information. Uh, the buttons are labeled edit profile, promote, and customers. Uh, you can update most elements of your business profile from these areas. All right, so let's take a look at how you can make the updates I mentioned directly from the search results page. First, you can edit the business description. You would click Edit Profile, then Business Information, then About. Uh, then on this screen, you will see a box labeled Description. Click on the area you want to edit, uh, and a pencil icon will appear. Clicking on that icon allows you to make edits and save those changes. This section allows you to edit other details as well, uh, including your business name, categories, contact information, location information, and so much more. It's important to make sure you keep your hours up to date because 40% of people searching for local businesses are looking for their hours. Uh, you can edit your business hours by clicking Edit Profile, then Hours, <clears throat> and you have several options. Uh, you can choose Open with Main Hours, which means you have uh, set hours when a customer can visit. You can choose open with no main hours. Uh, that just basically means a business profile uh, will not show with business hours. So like um, if you're open by appointment only, that might be an appropriate option, right? Uh, you can also indicate if your business is temporarily closed uh, or even permanently closed. Now below you will see separate sections for holiday hours and more hours. Like once again, more hours can let customers know uh, if you have special hours uh, for things like you know happy hours, senior hours, brunch, and, and more. The third way you can engage with customers uh, via your Google Business Profile is by publishing posts. Uh, you can use this feature to add timely updates. Posts can be seen on the updates or overview tabs of the business profile on search and maps when viewed with a mobile device. On the desktop and laptop computers, uh, they can be seen in the From the Owner section of the business profile in search maps. Uh, so to create a post, you would click Promote and then choose the type of post you want to create. Uh, you will see an Add Update, uh, an Add Up or Offer, or even Add Event. Uh, each post type has different fields. Uh, so like in this screenshot, you see an Update post, right? Uh, with this type of post, you can add a photo or a video, a description, and a button that can link to a page on your website. So here are a few ideas uh, for ways you can use posts. Uh, so once again, update posts can be used for announcements or to provide general information about your business, such as a new menu item. Uh, you can include a photo or video. A video can be 30 seconds or less. Uh, you can include a link, a, a call to action, or a CTA button, and other information. <clears throat> Offer posts can advertise promotions, sales, or special offers from your business. A view offer CTA button is automatically added to these posts. Uh, you can also include a photo or video, a coupon code, a link, and even terms and conditions. Uh, and the event posts can help you to promote upcoming events, uh, upcoming workshops, celebrations, fundraisers, and more. The fourth way to engage with customers via a business profile is by encouraging them to write reviews. 
Uh, so once your business profile is verified, you can also publicly respond to these reviews. Uh, make it easier for customers by sharing a link, right? You can find it by clicking promote, then ask for reviews. And be, be creative. You can share a link after you've had a positive interaction with the customer. Uh, you can include a link in emails or at the end of conversations on the chat. Uh, you might even print it on collateral like flyers and receipts. So many business owners have questions about the best way to respond to online reviews. Uh, let's start with a positive situation. Uh, someone left a five-star review for your business. Uh, once your business is verified, like I said, you'll have the option to respond and publicly thank them. Uh, it's also important to understand prompt responses show that you're paying attention to your customers, uh, but you don't have to respond to every positive response either. Uh, <clears throat> If you do have the time to do this, keep it short and sweet and maybe share some new relevant information. However, don't make your response a sales pitch. This is not the right place to include incentives and other advertisement that you may want to include. At some point, someone may write a negative review about your business. No one wants negative reviews, but it's important to keep them in perspective. If the majority of your reviews are written by happy customers, most potential customers will not be deterred by a negative review. Uh, you cannot remove a customer's review unless it violates one of Google's policies, uh, but you can publicly respond. And when we talk about that, here are some tips. Be nice, don't make it personal. Uh, in the event that a mistake was made, you know, be honest about it. Uh, honesty can go a long way. However, that does not mean that you need to take responsibility for things that are out of your control. Uh, like, so for example, if your customer, your company's uh, guided hiking trip was canceled because of a torrential thunderstorm, it wasn't your fault, right? Uh, but you can show compassion and empathy for a customer uh, by expressing disappointment and clarify your inclement weather policies. Uh, it's important to humanize yourself too. Include your name or your initials to remind people that a real person is reading the reviews and writing responses. Uh, and whenever possible, try to find constructive ways to address issues. Uh, and if a customer's issue is resolved, they might consider editing or amending their original negative review. Okay, so do you feel ready to respond to customer reviews? Uh, let's give it a try. All right, let me know what you think of each option in the chat. All right, so in this scenario, <clears throat> a happy customer really enjoyed their meal and wrote a five-star review, uh, and you're the business owner in charge of responding. What option would you choose? Okay, option number one, thanks. All right, so maybe write a bit more. So like, oh, I, on one hand, responding to a customer review shows that you're paying attention, uh, but on the other hand, a curt response like this doesn't foster the customer relationship or help potential customers see that you are a friendly business. Let's take a look at option two. Thank you for your kind words. We're so glad you enjoyed your meal. We look forward to seeing you again. Joe, the manager. Now this is a really good response. You're demonstrating that your restaurant is paying attention to customers, you're polite and you're friendly. Uh, and it also resisted the temptation to add an offer or another incentive to get them to come back. Option number three, no response. What do you guys think of that? Well, remember, this is a trick question. It's actually fine. Uh, you don't have to respond to every single review. Uh, it's certainly fine to send a short, sweet thank you, like in our example, second example. Uh, but if you don't have the resources because you're too busy cooking the best hamburgers, it's okay not to respond to every review. Let's give it another try. You can write your guesses in the chat. All right, so in this scenario, a pretty grumpy customer did not enjoy their meal at a restaurant. They wrote a scathing review and your business owner in charge of responding, what options would you choose or what option would you choose? Okay, so option number one, dear angry customer, try cooking your own hamburger next time. You're a big meanie and a lousy tipper. <laughs> All right, you might want to try that one again, right? Um, so remember, keep it cool. Stay polite and professional. 
and do not get personal. Number two, I'm sorry you did not have a good experience. We'd love a chance to make it up to you. Please send us an email to that email, uh, Joe, the manager. Uh, this is a really good response, right? Uh, you're, you are demonstrating that your restaurant wants to keep customers satisfied and coming back. The review uh, gives an irate customer the option to follow up and the name of the person who they can talk to. Take a look at option three. This week, we are offering 20% off of all reservations for brunch and free dessert if you mention this ad. Okay, again, like I said before, this is not a best response. Uh, it, number one, doesn't address the customer's concerns in any way. Uh, it offers irrelevant promotional information and it does not offer a path or a person for that customer to follow up with. Last but not least, you can use a feature called Messages to connect with customers via messages sent directly from Google Search and Maps. Uh, so messages let you connect with customers quickly. However, you need to have the staffing resources to promptly respond. Uh, if Google system detects an activity uh, based on your response time, it may automatically turn it off to avoid negative customer experiences. Uh, in the past, you needed to provide a phone number uh, but that is no longer the case. The feature just needs to be turned on. Uh, if you wanted to do that, you start by clicking customers, then messages. Uh, and when a customer sends a message, it will appear here, uh, as well as in the updates tab uh, found in Google Maps on the mobile app. Uh, you can turn messages on and off depending on your needs and really understand that. Turn them off if you're not gonna be able to respond, turn them on when you are. All right, so now that we've shown you ways to connect with customers using a Google Business Profile, let's switch gears and talk about connecting with a different set of tools, Google Calendar and Google Meet. Google Calendar and Google Meet are available in the free consumer version of Google's productivity tools, as well as business platforms called Google Workspace. Uh, if you wanna learn more about Google Workspace and how it's different than the consumer version, visit g.co slash workspace. Uh, in this workshop, we will focus on features that apply to both versions, uh, and we'll show you how to connect these products, plus offer some pro tips for getting more out of these tools. So if you've used Google Calendar before, this slide should look pretty familiar. Uh, I'll cover some of the features. Uh, so in the center section, you'll see events that you've added to your calendar. Uh, the Create button allows you to create new events. Uh, you'll be the only person who can see these events on your calendar unless you choose to share it with other people. Uh, beneath the Create button, there is a mini view of the full month. You can use this to quickly jump to a different date. Uh, below that, you'll see My Calendars, which is a list of calendars that you have access to. Uh, you can view or hide events from the calendar you have access to by checking or unchecking the box next to its name. The gear icon at the top of the screen allows you to edit settings for your calendars. One way to connect and engage with customers is to share a calendar. Uh, with Google Calendar, you can create multiple calendars that can be accessed by different people. Uh, for example, you might have a work calendar that you share with colleagues. You might have a private calendar that's shared with no one. Uh, and on this slide, you can see I'm creating a new calendar titled Shared Calendar. Uh, that can be shared publicly uh, if I set that up in the calendar settings. Uh, so here's how you do that. On the left side of your calendar, scroll down below my calendars until you see the section labeled Other Calendars. Uh, you would click that plus mark symbol next to Other Calendars to reveal a menu of options. From here, click uh, Create New Calendar. So when you create a calendar, it's private by default. No one else can see your calendar unless you share it with them or invite them to an event. Uh, when you create a new calendar, you will see sharing options, but you can manage sharing at any time. To do that, look for the calendar you want to manage under My Calendars, hover over that calendar name, uh, and then you'll see the three dot icon that appears on the right. Clicking this icon reveals a menu of options. And then you would click Settings and Sharing. Uh, so now you will see the calendar settings. You want to scroll down to the section labeled Access Permissions for Events. Uh, 
Uh, from here, you can click the checkbox to make your calendar publicly viewable and also get a shareable link. Or you can simply share that calendar with specific people. The Google Calendar features we've showed so far are available in every version, including the consumer version of the tools. Uh, if you use Google Workspace, the product that's designed for business users, you have access to some additional features. One common challenge for many people is time management uh, and managing work hours. Uh, this can become especially challenging if you attend a lot of meetings and if you work with people across multiple time zones. Uh, Google Workspace can help. Uh, one feature is called appointment slots. Uh, you can actually create blocks of time divisible into multiple appointment blocks and share them so people can reserve an appointment. Uh, this will be handy uh, inside your company or uh, if you're managing and supporting many people or several teams. Or uh, you can actually share it publicly and use it as a sales tool, uh, allowing potential customers to book time and discuss projects. Google Workspace has other event categories like focus time and out of office. Uh, they can be used to prevent others from scheduling meetings when you're unavailable. Finally, you have the option to edit your general calendar settings uh, and specify your working hours. Uh, so like when your colleague from across the world wants to schedule a meeting at 3 a.m. your time, uh, your calendar will show them that you are not available at that time. There's a lot more to Google Calendar in both the consumer and business versions, but let's talk about how you can use it in conjunction with Google Meet to engage with other people. Uh, when you created a calendar event, you're prompted to enter details, invite guests, uh, attach documents, add notes, schedule notifications, and more. Uh, the big blue button labeled Add Google Meet Video Conferencing allows you to add a video meeting accessible to the people you've added as guests. After you click the Add Google Meet Video Conferencing button, a URL will appear. This is the URL that people will use to access the video meeting. Uh, FYI, if you don't click the Add Google Meet Video Conferencing button, but add meeting guests, Calendar will automatically create a Google Meet link. Uh, you also have the option to remove it if you wish. After you save the meeting on your calendar, everyone you invited will receive an email notification. The invitation will include the Google Meet link that they can use to join the meeting. Uh, if they also use Google Calendar, the event will automatically appear there as well. People um, have the option to accept the invitation, uh, decline, stay non-committal with a maybe, uh, and even propose another day or time. If you created an event that includes a Google Meet call, uh, you are automatically the event host. To launch the meeting, go back to your calendar, click on the meeting, and then click Join with Google Meet. Everyone you've invited to the meeting can also access this link from their calendars, or they can click the link in their email invitation or simply visit meet.google.com. This is what it looks like when you're joining a Google Meet video call. As you can see, it works on desktop and mobile devices. Uh, while not every computer has a built-in camera, nearly every smartphone does you would click the Join Now button to enter the call. So this is an example of how, of how Google Meet might look uh, with multiple guests. Each person has the ability to change their view of the screen as well. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you see a set of controls in the center. These controls are self-explanatory, but I'll review them quickly. Uh, so the microphone icon allows you to mute or unmute your microphone. The camera icon allows you to turn your camera on and off. The button labeled CC allows you to turn on closed captioning. Uh, if you're using a Google Workspace business version, you will see a raised hand button next. Uh, the icon with the arrow symbol allows you to share your screen uh, with meeting attendees. Uh, you can share your entire screen, you can share a window, or you can share a tab. Uh, the three dots icon lets you access other options like layout, background effects, uh, audio and video settings, and more. Uh, and the red icon with the phone lets you leave the call. At the bottom of the screen, you see another set of controls on the right-hand side. The circled eye icon allows you to see the meeting details. Uh, so 
if a colleague texted you and asked you for the link to join the meeting, you could click that eye icon, copy the link, and then text it back. Uh, this will also show any file attachments from the calendar invitation. Uh, the people icon shows who's in the meeting uh, and who is muted. It also allows you to send email invitations to other people. Uh, the chat icon opens a panel on the right-hand side of the screen, so you can send in-call chat messages that are visible to everyone on the call. It's also a handy way to share links and other information with the group. The next symbol is the triangle, square, circle combo. Uh, this takes you to activities. Uh, the consumer version of Google Meet includes one option, the ability to create a virtual whiteboard. Uh, and then attendees can access this shared Jamboard uh, and mark up their ideas together. The last icon is a lock and shield. It shows you your host controls. From here, the host can restrict what meeting participants can do during the meeting. Uh, for example, you can enable or disable the ability to share screens, uh, send chat messages, and unmute microphones. Google Meet has a few additional features available only for Google Workspace accounts. Uh, you can see these under the activities icon, that triangle square circle combo. Uh, you can create breakout rooms, which splits attendees into smaller groups. You can also create polls for your audience uh, and you can record your meeting. Uh, please note that you should inform all attendees that the meeting will be recorded in advance. They will also see a record symbol uh, on the screen indicating that the meeting is actually being recorded. Google Meet video calls can help people feel engaged and connected. Uh, you can use them in many ways, including brainstorming sessions, client consultations, classes, uh, and virtual get-togethers. The consumer version of Google Meet allows up to 100 participants in a single call. Uh, the number of meetings is unlimited, but each meeting is limited to one hour. Uh, if you need more features, you can sign up for Google Workspace. Uh, there's a range of available plans starting at $6 per month per user. Depending on your selected plan, meetings can hold up to 500 attendees. Uh, to learn more and compare your plans, visit workspace.google.com slash pricing. So no matter what version of Google Meet you use, these tips can help you appear your best in a video call. Rule number one, when you're hosting or participating in a video call, keep your camera on whenever possible. It makes a better impression and helps people stay more engaged. Uh, when you're on camera, consider what's behind you. Choose a neutral background and reduce your clutter. Uh, alternatively, you can use Google Meet's built-in visual effects. Uh, this feature allows you to set up a blurry background uh, or you can even select a background image. It's also important that people can hear you. Uh, an external microphone may provide better sound quality uh, than the microphone that's actually built into your device. Uh, conversely, when you're not speaking, it's important that people not hear you. Uh, so remember to mute your microphone when someone else is speaking. Um, also try to limit your movement when you're on camera so you don't create distractions. Uh, you might consider turning your camera off just temporarily if you have to move around. So far, this workshop has focused on using Google tools to engage and connect with people. Now, let's shift gears one last time to show how Google tools can help you do this work no matter where you are and no matter what device you're using. As long as you have access to the internet, a device with a web browser, uh, your username and your password, you can work from anywhere. So in this section, we'll introduce another Google product called Google Drive. Put simply, Google Drive holds your stuff. Uh, so Google Drive is cloud storage. Uh, you can liken it to a giant online filing cabinet that holds your documents, your spreadsheets, presentations, emails, plus other files like images, videos, and PDFs. If you already signed into Google using another Google tool like Gmail, you might see a grid icon at the upper right-hand corner. Uh, so clicking this icon reveals an app menu that includes Google Drive. Uh, FYI, the apps you use most frequently appear here first, but you can click and drag to rearrange this menu. If you can't find the apps menu or the Google Drive icon, uh, simply visit drive.google.com. 
Once you access Drive, you can upload and download files, uh, and then you can manage your file access. Um, by default, they are private, uh, but you can share them with specific people, groups, or even make them available publicly. Uh, you can also turn on the option to edit files offline. So you can upload almost any type of file to Google Drive, whether it's originated in Google or not. Uh, this means that you can upload Microsoft Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, photos, videos, um, whatever. Um, also, you can create files with Google tools like Google Docs. Uh, these files are automatically saved in Google Drive, uh, and then you can export them into other formats, including Microsoft Word and PDF format. Now, Google Drive allows you to create folders and subfolders to help keep your files organized. Uh, you have the option to share individual files or entire folders as you choose. And you can select a range of different access for those shared files um, from read-only access uh, to full edit access. Uh, if you can't find the file you're looking for, you can use that search bar at the top of the screen. You can search in a variety of ways, including uh, searching by keyword, file type, file owner, labels, uh, locations, and a whole bunch more. All right, so let's look at another feature that makes collaboration easier. Uh, once you created a document, you might want to share it with other people. To do that, you click the blue share button at the upper right-hand corner. You can then add email addresses and assign their editing level. Uh, so people you share the file with receive an email notification that that file has been shared with them. Another feature called comments allows you to highlight and share particular words or sentences or even sections within a document with your collaborators. You can create comments for your own reference or using the pointed items in the document to specific people. All right, so here's how you do that. Uh, first, you want to highlight a word or a phrase that you want to include in the comment. Uh, in this example document, uh, one discussion item is an upcoming retirement party. Uh, the agenda includes the sentence, do we have restaurant reservations yet? To add a comment to the sentence, you would highlight it, uh, then click the Add Comments icon at the top. Uh, it looks like a plus symbol. Uh, then you would type your message in the pop-up box that appears to the right-hand side of the document. Everyone with access to this document can then see that comment. Uh, you can also alert or assign other people to comments. Uh, if you wanted to do that, you would simply click the plus or at symbol on your keyboard followed by that person's email address. Uh, just make sure there's no space between the plus or add symbol and the email address. Uh, so when you alert or assign a comment to another person, they receive an email notification that prompts them to read the comment. Uh, people you comment in can see the entire document as well. Uh, this process works the same way in all Google products, including Google Sheets and Google Slides. So Google Drive lets you access your files from anywhere, but sometimes the place you're at might not have internet access. Uh, but with a little bit of advanced planning, you can stay productive by enabling offline access for the files you need to work on. Uh, the Make Available Offline feature allows you to open, edit, and even save work in the files you choose when you don't have an internet connection. And of course, once your device has internet access, the changes you made will be added to your file stored in Google Drive. Uh, you do need to set this up while you have an internet connection and on the device you plan to use when you're offline. Uh, so in other words, be sure to enable this option on the device you're going to use before you get stuck in a place without an internet connection. So to make files available offline, you simply open a file, go to the file menu, uh, and then scroll to make available offline and click it to enable. All right, so now let's bring this workshop full circle. Earlier, we talked about using Google Calendar to connect with people online. Uh, now that you know how to create or upload files to Google Drive, let's talk about how you can add the files to your calendar events. This screenshot shows the example event uh, from the earlier slides. Uh, when you open an event, you look for that paperclip icon. Clicking that opens a pop-up that allows you to search Drive for files you want to include with your event. Now you can also upload a file from your computer uh, to add to the event as well. Uh, and that actual file will be automatically added to and saved to your Google Drive. 
Guests who were invited to the event will be able to see and comment on the documents you've attached to this calendar event. Uh, if you want to give them edit access, you will need to share that document with them. The final piece is adding your Google Drive documents to a Google Meet video call. Uh, there is more than one way to do this. Uh, in this case, if you have the document open, like in our example, uh, the Team Sync Meeting doc, uh, you can click the Present to Meeting icon in the top right corner. It looks like a arrow pointing up inside a box. Uh, you may see your meeting listed here that you're looking to, to, to present it with. If not, enter the URL for the meeting found in a calendar event. Uh, you will be then asked if you want to share a window, a tab, or your entire screen. Uh, we will share the tab with this Google Doc. And so this is what it looks like inside a Google Meet video call. Uh, the Google Doc, which is saved in Google Drive, appears in the main screen of this call. If the document was added as an attachment to the calendar event, guests can actually open the document and follow along live in the document if they wish. To stop sharing your screen, simply click the button labeled Stop Sharing. We covered a lot of information today. Let's recap and look at some of the resources to help you keep learning. Here's a recap of the topics we covered today and ideas for your next steps. First, use your Google Business Profile to connect and engage with customers. Try some of the features we discussed, like posts, responding to reviews, and messages. Uh, if you use Google Calendar, try creating shareable calendars to improve workflow and communication with customers and colleagues. Add Google Meet video calls to your calendar events to make your meetings more engaging. Uh, and try tools like Google Drive to make your life easier working in this digital age. Finally, try using the products together. A Google Calendar event can include a Google Meet video call and a document from Google Drive. So take one moment and think about all the topics we covered today. Can you write down one thing that you will do next? The start of your action plan. If you'd like to share, please type it in the chat box. So I mentioned several Google tools in this session. <clears throat> Here's a quick list. Uh, make some time in your schedule to explore these resources and learn some more. If you want to sharpen your business and marketing skills, check out Primer. This is a free app that you can download to your phone. Uh, if you have an Android device, you can download it at Google Play. If you have an Apple device, you can download it from the App Store. Primer has a series of short, fun lessons that are less than five minutes each. Uh, we've added a link to Primer in the resources section, which you can access below the video player on the right-hand side. And stay tuned to grow with Google on Air to keep growing your digital skills and to help stay connected and productive while working or managing a business remotely. You can visit g.co slash grow on air to learn more. Grow with Google is a new initiative to help people prepare for work, find jobs, uh, and grow their businesses. Uh, so job seekers can grow their skills in order to find new jobs and advance their careers. Teachers can learn how to put the latest technology to work inside and outside of the classroom. Small business owners can build their online presence and find new customers. Startups can learn how to get their ideas, the exposure they need to succeed. Uh, and developers can sharpen their current skills and master new ones. To learn more, visit google.com slash grow. All right, so this wraps up the presentation portion of today's workshop. Now give us a few moments to gather some of the questions you submitted for the live Q&A. We will see you in a few. All right, we are back and I'm excited to answer a few of the questions you've asked throughout this session. And as usual, we received quite a few of them. Remember, if we don't get your question, we'll go back and answer them all on the Growth Google on their page. 
below their virtual event shortly after it concludes. Okay, so let's get to the first question here is from Sydney. Sydney says, can I just use the app for managing my Google My Business profile? Great question. Uh, and the answer to that is check your email, Sydney. Um, we've been actually sending out quite a few uh, email updates about the fact that, um, well, number one, it's no longer Google My Business. It is now your Google Business profile. Um, <clears throat> And making some changes, right? So uh, you should have seen like the first few were notifying you about upcoming changes. Uh, and just recently, I believe it was either yesterday or the day before, uh, they announced uh, that the Google Business app um, is actually being replaced. Uh, and you can use Google Maps and search to manage most of your business profile. Now the app, um, as well as the google.com slash business uh, is still active and you can use them because there are a couple of features that um, you can only do in those. But, you know, keep your ears open and check your email uh, for future updates. All right. Next question here is from Lynn. Lynn wants to know if our business is online only, is it still possible to have a Google business profile keeping the mailing address used for the verification private? Um, good question, Lynn. This is a really good question. We get this one a lot, uh, especially from our online only businesses. <clears throat> and the statement is simply is to qualify for a business profile, um, you must make in-person contact with a customer during your business stated hours. Um, if you're truly online only, this isn't the best tool for you. It's important to understand the whole purpose of the Google business profile is so that customers can find you physically, like where are you? Uh, and Or you can at least, you know, they can find you in their particular area. Um, so, doesn't really apply to you, unfortunately. Um, I, it's, we get that question a lot. So uh, the next question here is from Doug S. Uh, how do I change the primary owner of a Google My Business account? Everyone keeps calling it Google My Business. <laughs> um, so when we talk about your Google Business profile, uh, primary ownership can only be transferred uh, to another user if they actually are uh, in your profile as an owner. And this is actually one of the features that can't be done through search and maps yet, right? Um, so you will have to either go to the app <clears throat> or go to google.com um, slash business and then click manage and then look for the user section. So in that user section is where you can add additional users uh, and then you can add someone as an owner. And then once they accept it and they're part of the actual account, uh, whatever the email address is, doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, once that business is actually um, an owner, then you can actually tr uh, transfer primary ownership to that account. All right, next question is from Kay Westbrook. What if I just want to pay for Meet, but not Google Workspace? Why don't you want to pay for Google Workspace? And no, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, so that's a, a great question. Uh, we get that one quite often now uh, with everyone, of course, working remotely. And yes, uh, you do actually have the ability to pay for just Google Meet. This is actually one of the few apps that you can uh, pay for separately outside of Google Workspace. Uh, so if you're looking for more information on that, you want to check out, it's uh, apps.google.com slash meet. Uh, and then you can get more information about the different tiers and pricing. Next question here is from Nick. And Nick wants to know, how often do you recommend posting updates to my Google profile? All right, there is Google profile this time. <clears throat> so as far as we talk about um, posts, Nick, it's a great question. Um, they last about seven days, depending on the type of post you're, you're putting up there uh, on your Google business profile. But the, the key thing to understand is this is not a social media account. Like a lot of people mistake their business profile as a social media account. I can post, yay, and do all these things. Uh, if you're just posting things that really offer no value to your customers, um, then you're just wasting your time. Uh, so really take the time and understand, like, what can I do in the sense of updating them about my business and things that are happening that are relevant to them that are going to make them want to engage with your business uh, and then kind of gauge it based on that. Um, so really use that as your gauge uh, more than just like, how, you know, how many times should I be bombarding them? Uh, valuable content, valuable information uh, is going to drive better, better engagement on your profile. Okay, next question here is from Francis. Francis is not asking or saying, uh, she or he is saying offline doesn't work for my drive. Oh, so <laughs> I'm guessing you mean offline editing. Uh, so when we talk about offline editing, uh, this is only available for um, your primary account on the computer you're currently working on. 
Now that's tricky. Like, so what is the primary account? So the primary account is simply the first account you log into, right? You sign into on that machine, <clears throat> followed by the rest of the accounts. And this will vary from machine to machine. So if you work on different computers, uh, you may sign into your business account on one first, and that's your primary account. And then the other one, the other laptop or computer, your personal email might be your primary account. Uh, and so if you want whichever account you want to be primary, it's very simple. Like, so I want us, I want this one to be my primary account, sign out of all your accounts. So click on your account profile picture, or it might be your initials in the upper right hand corner, uh, and then click on sign out of all accounts. And then from there, you would then sign in to whatever account you want to be your primary account and have offline editing access for. Now, now I'm thinking like, well, why can't I have offline access for all my accounts? Well, you can. Uh, but in order to do that, you would actually have to download the Google Drive desktop app, and then you can as many accounts as you want to have offline access. You can have even the ability to choose which files and folders will have offline access so you're not taking up a ton of space on the computer you're currently working on. Just understand when you're talking about that, that's only for the computer you're working on, whether it's the Google Drive app or just um, primary accounts, um, you know, whatever it is, it's always machine specific. Okay. Next question here is from Jerika, uh, and Jerika says, my business doesn't have an address since I go to my clients when they are interested in what I specialize in. What would I be able to make um, a business account of any kind? That's a great question. And actually, yes, you would. Uh, so uh, Jerika, when you start talking about setting up a business profile, um, you serve a local service area, right? Uh, and you have the ability to do that in the sense of and when you're setting up your account, you set yourself up as a, you know, a service based business uh, and you have the ability to designate the area you serve. And a lot of people say, well, I want to designate the entire United States, the entire world. Uh, that's not going to really help you from people finding you locally. So really understand uh, a local service area uh, where your customers are, are located. Um, and then you can do that. Right. So you don't actually have to show your address, uh, but you can show the area where you meet your customers. Uh, and then uh, you still will require um, your actual address, whether it's your home address or your business address. Um, that's simply for verification purposes only. So the Google has somewhere to send that postcard where you can then get that um, that verification code and put it in to actually activate your account. Uh, but that address does not have to actually be live on your um, business profile. All right. Uh, next and last question here is from Ryan J. If I share a link to a file in my drive with someone, um, can they share it with someone else? <clears throat> well, that's a great question, Ryan, and it all depends on your settings. Um, so by default, no one has access, of course, to your files unless you share it with them. Uh, but like once you share with them, the restrictions will be based on the number one, the type of collaborator uh, they are. So for example, if you give them view only access, they won't have the ability to share that file with anyone. Um, but if you do give them editor access, uh, by default, they will. Now you do have the ability to restrict editors from sharing the file with additional people if you want. Uh, and if you can do that, if you want to do that currently, uh, the option for that is like when you actually get to that screen where you're adding all your collaborators, in the upper right hand corner, you see a little gear icon, you can click on that. Uh, and there are two um, sharing specific things when it comes to allowing editors to be able to share outside of um, the organization or share it to anyone else uh, and some other stuff regarding um, restrictions on sharing. So definitely check that out and you'll be good to go. All right. So that wraps up our Q&A portion for today. Um, thank you all for joining us for Connect with Customers and Manage Your Business Remotely. Hopefully everyone learned something new. Uh, so you can find all of our file resources on the same page you're watching in the resources tab below the video player. And you can also access a recording of today's session by clicking on demand at g.co slash go on air. I will also be sending a follow-up email uh, with a survey for you to fill out regarding your experience in the virtual workshop today. Uh, it's really important that you provide us that feedback so we can quickly improve these sessions and offer content that is most helpful for you and other learners. All right. Thank you again for joining us with Growth Google today, and we will see you next time.